And somehow we believe our concept that we'll be here forever, that our life is really going to go on and on and on and on. Or we believe the advertising, the things from our culture, that if you get this, you'll be able to hold on to it and it will make you happy. And it's just not true. Happiness is a, is a matter of the heart and it's not something that we can grasp or hold. Welcome to the Jack Cornfield Heart Wisdom Hour. We are delighted to share with you Jack's innate common sense wisdom and his clear open heart. If you are interested in supporting Jack's podcast, go to BeHereNowNetwork.com slash Jack. What is happening, Heart Wisdom fam? It's once again Ganesh Braymiller here. Jack's media manager, content specialist, and ashwagandha sipping elephant, getting you all tucked in for a comfy and rather dreamy episode of the podcast. After getting a couple fresh guest episodes in the books this past month, I've decided to dive deeper into the depths of the Cornfield Archives to hand pluck a vintage Dharma talk from April 18th, 1985, within which a softly spoken but energetically lit up Jack illuminates Buddhism's three characteristics of life, Anicca, which is impermanence, anatta, which is non-self, and dukkha, which we're translating here as stress. And I love the translation of dukkha as stress rather than suffering. Suffering, I feel, often gets confused with pain, which is inevitable in this samsara that we live in, within this life. Can't get away from pain. Whereas suffering is truly optional. Another Be Here Now Network podcaster and death and dying expert, Ram Dev, Dale Borglum, states it this way, Resistance causes suffering. Pain doesn't cause suffering. Resistance to pain causes suffering. So when I can think of stress, stress isn't acute pain. It feels more like a layer of mental tension thrown over whatever situation one happens to be engrossed in. To me, this feels more fixable and workable than the concept of suffering. Then jiving on a nata, non-self, can sometimes be a rather lofty, heady concept, but Jack breaks it down really well and peels back the veil, reflecting to us that non-self is not actually a concept at all. It's truly the opposite of concept. That our notion of self is literally just a thought, a thought that we bind together into strings of thoughts for most of our life. He explains, though, that when we meditate and start moving past our belief in our own thoughts to reach that place of sacred silence, we are actually in that moment abiding in anatta, in non-self. So this is truly attainable, if attainable is a word you can use there. It's more of an ever-present birthright and basis of being, waiting for you to lay down your tireless thoughts and rest in love, awareness, and presence. And for impermanence, Jack has a truly fire quote to share. Somehow we believe our concepts that we'll be here forever, that our life is going to go on and on and on and on and on. Or we believe our advertising, the idea from the culture that if you get this, you'll be able to hold on to it and it will make you happy. It's just not true. Happiness is a matter of the heart, not something we can grasp or hold on to. So now we're getting cozy and comfy and ready to nestle into the sweetness of this vintage episode. I do have to jump into some quick announcements before flipping the lights off and tucking y'all in. On May 15th, our Ram Dass Love Server member fam, whoop, whoop, they light up the incense on the new Ram Dass and Friends online course, The Yoga of Heartfulness, featuring live teachings from Krishna Das, Nina Rao, Jayu Tal, Mirabai Star, and more, as well as 10 plus hours of classic archival footage and practices from Ram Dass, Trudy Goodman, and our very own Jack Cornfield. Sign up at ramdas.org slash heart. Then on June 3rd, tuck yourself in to Jack's online event, The Awakened Heart, an invitation to love, presented by Spirit Rock, and featuring meditations, stories, and dialogue on illuminating your own inner gifts of love, gratitude, forgiveness, and the heart. Then take your dreams to the clouds, 
with Tara Brocks and Jack's brainchild for finding digital spiritual community, Cloud Sangha, who just opened two new Jack Cornfield focus groups, Loving Kindness and Buddhist Wisdom. Find your digital spiritual community at cloudsangha.co slash Jack Cornfield. And finally, don't sleep on Jack's amazing array of online courses and classes, as well as exceptional offerings like Dharma Talks, meditations, and articles over on the new jackcornfield.com. So there we are, Heart Wisdom fam. Time to turn down the lights, tuck in, lay back, and let your mind float like a lotus flower softly making its way downstream for episode 187, The Three Characteristics of Life. Again, this is Ganesh Bramiller, wishing you the most blessed, fruitful, and enjoyable time incarnated here on Earth. Namaste, y'all. People want to know, especially those of you who've been sitting for some number of retreats and on the hours when things seem frustrating or painful or something, and doubt arises, people want to know, where's the practice going? What happens if you continue to sit and walk and pay attention and open? And sometimes we speak of the stages of deepening of practice, of opening of newer visions of things, or of the cultivation, as Jamie uh, taught quite beautifully last night, of the factors of mind, of enlightenment, of rapture, of calm, of tranquility, of equanimity, of mindfulness, and so forth. The spiritual faculties that, that grow more deeply and strong as we sit. The qualities of a bodhisattva, greater openness of heart, greater sense of generosity and uh, simplicity in life. And all these things do develop and grow. You can see and feel it, even if it seems a little slow at times. Because it's such a deep process, it is slow. It's an unfolding or an opening from the very center of our being. And although these are not incorrect in describing practice, There's a difficulty with them, and that is that they set up some vision of the future, some goal that's always measured in front of us, in time, out there. Greater equanimity, greater mindfulness, greater kindness, greater something or other, some other place that we will achieve down the road. And so they're part of the realm of thought or imagination. And the truth is that we can't really measure our practice. I discovered it quite powerfully doing a retreat, a solitary retreat, one year in a room in Stephen Levine's house in Santa Cruz. And I practiced quite hard and got very concentrated and still. And then on the last day, my sitting, a lot of thoughts came. And I thought, oh, well, here I was. I was very quiet and open. And now it's sort of back to the beginning. And I went out from my retreat of those days and took a walk through downtown Santa Cruz and then down on the boardwalk by the beach where there were lots of summer visitors. And my perceptions were totally different than I'd walked when I'd walked in. The sea and the colors were dazzling and it was as if I was intoxicated or stoned in some fashion and my mind was very, very silent. But in the space, in the middle of a retreat, It's like being on a boat in the ocean. You don't have a shoreline to refer to. So with its many waves and ups and downs, at times it's hard to measure or judge. How am I doing? How far along have I gotten? What's needed, says St. Francis de Sales, is a cup of knowledge, a barrel of love, and an ocean of patience. And even better than patience is Suzuki Roshi's word, a spirit of constancy, of just coming back to the moment. For truthfully, how can we measure anything? Measurement is always in memory, in thought. It's versus some ideal or some image we have. And what's actually here in our life is what's present now. If it's not in time and not cultivated or in stages, What other way can we see it? We've heard be here now as a phrase over many years, living in the present. It's so often said. Yet there's something 
perhaps more to understand about what it means to be in the present. In fact, all of our practice, all of the sitting and walking, the various aspects of Dharma practice, our training of mindfulness and awareness to see, to feel, to sense, to think, to see how thinking and all of the processes of body and mind operate, bring us to understand in the present moment one of three things, what are called the three characteristics of life, anicca, dukkha, ananaka. And these three also are then the watchword or the basis for various meditation techniques and different styles and teachers and teachings. So let's look at them for a moment, consider each one. The first one to examine for this evening is the characteristic of dukkha. Dukkha or sorrow or suffering or unsatisfactoriness is the first of the three characteristics. And some ways of teaching and some teachers emphasize it a great deal. They say, look at it, pay attention to it, feel it, sense it, see, it's all around. Sometimes people come to an interview in meditation and they say, it's going terribly, hearing is bothersome and thinking is too much and my body hurts, and I, if only I could get it to be pleasant and happy. And actually what may be happening in that time is that they're simply seeing the characteristic of dukkha. It's actually insight. It's not a problem. We just wish that it would go away. And so the understanding of the characteristic of dukkha, it's the first noble truth of the four noble truths of suffering. It can be seen in the world at large. So we've spoken of the numbers of people who live lives of poverty or of starvation, who are hungry, who are sick and don't have medicine. Of the 50 or 60 countries that Amnesty International lists as places uh, where political prisoners are held and people are, are hurt and harmed and tortured and caused to feel pain because of some belief of theirs, religious or political. The worldly dukkha of the nuclear arms race, of all the wealth and resources and creativity of modern, modern society, half or more of it is poured into making killing machines that can destroy us. And it goes on today. The dukkha and suffering of the wars that exist now, the 40 or 45 wars in Iraq and Iran and Cambodia and Vietnam and Guatemala and El Salvador and on and on and so forth. So one sees it externally and one sees it internally as well, sees our own fears and resistances and attachments and grief and loss and separation and sorrow and so forth. There is one thing amongst the Buddha said or O nuns, both of you, that the not seeing of which keeps us bound on this wheel of becoming, of grasping, of hoping. And so it's true in the world outside, but it's very much true in ourselves as well. We have to begin to really see it and in some measure to believe it. The obituary pages tell us of the news that we are dying away while the birth announcements in finer print at the side of the page inform us of our replacements. But we get no grasp from this of the enormity of the scale. There are five billion of us on the earth, and all five billion must be dead on schedule within this lifetime. This vast mortality involving something over 70 million of us each year takes place in relative secrecy. Less than half a century from now, our replacements will have more than doubled the numbers. It's hard to see how we can continue to keep the secret with such multitudes doing the dying. We will have to give up the notion that death is catastrophe or detestable or avoidable or even strange and need to learn more about the cycling of life and the rest of the system. 
It's to see the fact, the truth of suffering, the truth of old age, the truth of sickness. And some teachers, there's a woman in Thailand, Ajahn Neb, who's a wonderful old meditation master. Her way of getting people to practice and understand with wisdom is twofold. First, she says, don't make any movements or changes of posture until you see the cause. And when you look into all the cause of our activity, very often you discover that its cause is discomfort or pain or suffering. And then we move or act to relieve it. And in a more systematic way, she will tell people, wake up some morning in your little meditation cottage or at home, and make the resolve not to do anything that you don't have to. Just to observe, not to do. Just be comfortable and happy and do nothing unless you're forced to do it. So you wake up and you lie in the bed. And at first it's very pleasant and comfortable. And then you realize it's uncomfortable to lie in that position. It starts to hurt. So you roll over to one side. You lie there for a while. And again, maybe you're bored, so that's uncomfortable. Or maybe it's hard after a while on that arm or maybe you have to pee you know it's the morning and the bladder hurts so you're not going to do anything you don't have to so there's the pain of the bladder you roll over to alleviate the pain and then you get up and you go in the bathroom and you pee and then that pain disappears and there you are sitting or standing in the bathroom depending on your want um, the floor is cold or the toilet seat is cold it's not so pleasant you know you see, and it's cold, you're shivering, and it's not so comfortable, and it's hard. And so you sit there for a while, you're not going to do anything you don't have to. And you realize it's painful. The floor is coldness, the seat's hard. So you get up, and you go put something comfortable on, and you sit down in an easy chair in the, in the uh, living room. And you're just going to sit there and relax, and it's very comfortable. And then what happens for a while? You start to feel hunger. It hurts your stomach. So, okay, here's another pain to deal with. So you get up from the chair again, you go in the kitchen, get yourself some food to eat to alleviate that pain. And then as you stand there or sit and you're finished eating, there's all the dishes and the stuff, and it's a mess, and you realize if you leave it out, it will smell and be unpleasant and also painful to deal with. So you get up and you wash the dishes, and then you're in the kitchen, and you're there and there's nothing else to do, and maybe it's the pain of just being bored or restless. Or maybe it's uncomfortable sitting on the hard kitchen chair. So you go and you get up and you find something else. And on and on through the day. And you start to see that from one perspective, the movement of our life is an alleviation of discomfort. Has anyone seen that in the meditation retreat? <laughs> you sit and you start, because you don't move so much, you start to see. You start to trace down and see... Just because we have a physical body, because we push the button on the elevator and it said earth and you get out and they give you one of these things with all the little things on the end of it that you learn how to wiggle after a while and, and you take it around and you feed it and you jog it and you marry it and you do all these things with it, you know. Um, because you have it, its nature is partly pleasant and partly painful. There's nobody who has a body where there isn't physical pain. And so for the mind as well, until there's a tremendous degree of detachment, there will be a lot of kinds of mental suffering. And so we say in practice, see it, don't run away from it. We create a schedule, we sit for certain hours and walk, and really keep things simple. And it points to coming back to that which we keep trying to squirm away from. The fact that there is dukkha in life, it's one of the characteristics of seeing, hearing, tasting, smelling, touching, and thinking. It's unsatisfactory in that there's pain itself, some of the time, say half the time, the other half's pleasant. It's unsatisfactory because even when it's not painful, when it's pleasant, what happens to it? You have a pleasant taste, or pleasant sight, or pleasant sound, or sensation, and then it's gone. That's another aspect of dukkha, the dukkha of change. And so we sit and we open to this truth. And we're generally afraid of it because our culture is afraid of pain. 
We've talked about that in other retreats of dressing up corpses like they're going to parties and putting men, people who are mentally ill in mental hospitals and old people in old age homes and poor people in ghettos. And so you don't have to look at it. And then watching TV and seeing Dallas and Falcon Crest and, and stuff like that and sort of the, the, the good life. But it's not true. And so when we sit and we pay attention and open, we see that we have to face this, which our society runs away. And we've had fear of it. But it's possible to come into the middle of it and see that our fear is really just a story about it. This is from Ajahn Chah. He says, when you take a good look at it, this world of ours is just that much. It exists just as it is. Whatever is pleasurable, delicious, exciting, good, even that is just that much. It has a limit. It's not anything outstanding. The Buddha taught that everything is just that much of equal value. We should meditate on this. Look at the elements of our body and mind, our senses. They're conditioned phenomena. They arise for a moment and pass, rising from a cause and therefore impermanent. Their nature is always the same. It cannot be changed. A great noble and a common servant are the same. When they become old, their act comes to an end. They can no longer put on airs or hide behind masks. There's nowhere to go, no more taste, no more texture. When you get old, your sight becomes dim, your hearing weakens, your body becomes feeble. You must face yourself. We human beings are in constant combat, at war to escape the fact of being just that much. But instead of escaping, we just continue to create more suffering, waging war with good, waging war with evil, waging war with what is small, waging war with what is too big, waging war with what is short or long or right or wrong, courageously carrying on the battle. We must use our practice fully to discover how we are caught and discover the heart of peace. So we start to see as we sit the truth of dukkha, and there's no way you get out of it. It's part of our life and our experience. There are, however, different ways to relate to it. Although we cannot avoid it because through impermanence and through having a body and living in this world, it is part of experience, we can learn to relate to it wisely somehow both with some freedom or non-attachment and with an opening of our heart. And one of the most extraordinary things in visiting Mother Teresa's dying center in Calcutta was to see even people who were very poor and scrawny and sick in the circumstance of what would what one would imagine to be a great deal of sorrow in the midst of that, on a big, beautiful poster on the wall with her picture smiling, there's a saying from Mother Teresa about, our work is not just to, to feed the poor and clothe, uh, clothe the naked, but to bring them the joy of our understanding and our love of Jesus. And one goes in there, and even though there are these terrible circumstances, the nuns are beautiful, and their faces are shining, and they laugh and giggle and, and share their delight in life with the people that they feed and clothe and help. And there's this extraordinary sense in the midst of that circumstance that the light of the heart of loving kindness is much greater than all the physical suffering in the world. It's quite amazing. Overcome any bitterness that may have come because you were not up to the magnitude of the pain that was entrusted to you, says the Sufi teachings. Like the mother of the world who carries the pain of the world in her heart, each one of us is part of her heart, and therefore each is endowed with a certain measure of cosmic pain. You are sharing in the totality of that pain and called upon to meet it in joy instead of self-pity. It's what one of my teachers called developing a heart of greatness, an opening of the heart that can allow the fact that there is 
pleasure and pain and joy and sorrow all together in the world, and that pain hurts, but that it's okay, that somehow our hearts are genuinely big enough to live in this life with compassion, to face it all. So that's the first of the characteristics. And you sit and you have a hard day and you think that there's no insight. The hard day is the insight. That's it. It's true. You understand, huh? Okay. Then what's the second characteristic? The second is impermanence. And so certain teachers will stress suffering and even create retreats. You sit and you don't move and you really deal with pain and you don't don't uh, let yourself get away with anything at all until you really see it. Other styles and ways of practice emphasize the truth of change. Don't worry. Whatever happens to you will change. It's all going to change. The very nature of being born is to grow up and grow old and die. The very nature of a state arising in the mind is that it will pass away. And the Buddha very often repeated the teachings of change. He would say, did you never see an old person or a sick person or a dying person? Do you think that it won't happen to you? Did you never see a house that was beautiful and is now crumbling? Did you never see a tree that was in blossom and is now fallen? A very good friend of mine, Michelle, who was supposed to be teaching this retreat together, she used to teach little children, worked as a teacher in camps and in the first years of elementary school, and she said she would talk to them about death because at a certain age, five, six, or seven, they start to wonder about it. She remembered taking some children out in the forest one day and gave them an exercise. She said, I want you to look and see if you can find all the things that are dead or dying. And so they found wilted mushrooms and dead logs and plants and leaves that had fallen off the trees that had died and various things. And they were excited by it. It wasn't a problem. It was a discovery about life. And she sat them down and they all shared their little discoveries. And then she said, now tell me, she said, what do you think would happen if there wasn't any dying? And they sat for a minute, she said, and then a couple of the, the little kids very brightly looked up and they said, well, then there'd be more and more and more trees and more and more things, and there wouldn't be any room for us. And there's this process of things coming into being and passing away. Everything which arises passes. Nazarudin was at his home and the friend came by to borrow his donkey. And uh, some of you have heard this too many times. And um, it's good, you can laugh before it's over. <laughs> and he says, I'm sorry my donkey isn't here. I like it a lot the fact that Stephen Levine raises donkeys when we teach together. He talks about his own donkeys. But anyway, and um, his friend said, oh, that's too bad. I have all this stuff to carry to Mark and it'll be such a burden. And he's leaving the house and he hears a donkey bray in the backyard. And he stomps up the stairs very angry. And he says, what do you mean to tell me the donkey's not here? And he's so indignant. And Nasrudin looks back and he says, who are you going to believe, me or the donkey? Okay. And somehow we believe our concepts that we'll be here forever, that our life is really going to go on and on and on and on. Or we believe the advertising, the things from our culture, that if you get this, you'll be able to hold on to it and it will make you happy. And it's just not true. Happiness is a, is a matter of the heart and it's not something that we can grasp or hold. So you sit, and what do you see? The body changes, sensations. It may change from pain to agony and then back to restlessness, but it keeps changing. And then sometimes it gets peaceful and changes back and forth, sukha and dukkha, pleasure and pain. The feelings change. Moods come and go sad, happy, neutral, open, joyful, depressed, grieving, sorrowful, light, um, calm, collected, angry, fearful, on and on. Thoughts come and go, moment after moment, pictures, images, memories, sounds come, sights come. 
Can you hold on to any of it? Even if you really want to. Has anybody gotten any mind state to stay? <laughs> Somebody raised their hand once when I asked that and said, yes, ignorance. It's been here a long time. <laughs> But basically, when you look at it, it is all in process of change. And so what's important is not some attainment or getting something. It's not even dying at the end of our life then, but now. For to live in wisdom, to live in, in the fullness of the Dharma, is first to accept dukkha and see that it's part of the game and be able to play with it a little bit. And secondly, to accept change. To feel it, to know it, to see it. To live in this moment is a kind of dying. It's called dying before death. And it allows one to become free. Yet we keep trying somehow to make it safe or solid. You know, when we get insecure and so we have all our ways of um, trying to hold on. You get a nice experience in meditation and then the next day you sit down and you think, well, gee, I sat and I put my foot like this and I filled in my head and I breathed in this way. Maybe I can get it back and that will make it okay. You know? Or with our relationships or our families or our, or our bank accounts or whatever, somehow trying to make it solid. And of course it doesn't work because it's, it's movement, it's waves. It's better to see that meditation, as Swami Satchitananda teaches, is like learning how to surf. That image of him standing in this one-legged yoga posture on this beautiful, uh, on the surfboard on a huge wave. And it says, you can't stop the waves, but you can learn to surf. Meditate with Swami Satchitananda or something like that. <laughs> it gives a sense that practice isn't to get somewhere, but to learn balance in the midst of change. Not to try and hold it, but to discover the rhythms of change. We keep trying to make it solid, and we keep trying to get something, as if getting it will, will make it okay, some state, some experience, some attainment. Not merit, nor insight, nor good deeds, nor concentration, nor calm, nor rapture. None of these are the reasons I teach, said the Buddha. But the sure heart's release, this and this alone. And that comes through an opening to the truth of dukkha, of the fact that there is life and there is death, that there is a rising and passing, and to the truth of impermanence, that what we have and what we are is a changing, ever-changing process. A star at dawn, a bubble in a stream, an echo, a rainbow, a phantom, a dream, a flash of lightning in a summer cloud. All these images. It's here and then it changes. And it's fantastic if we can come to rest in it. Come to rest in what Alan Watts called the wisdom of insecurity. The wisdom of seeing that there's nothing which can be held. So that's the second characteristic, Anicca. The third characteristic, all of these are, are like the donkey. They're right there in front of our face when we sit. Is the characteristic of emptiness or selflessness. And so some teachers will say it's all dukkha and look at it and accept the fact of pain as part of life. Don't run so fast and you can come to rest and joy. Other teachers will say it's all changing. Just learn to find balance and open to the truth of change. Other teachings and teachers will say it's all empty. None of it is I or me or mine. None of it is to be grasped. It's ownerless. How can we understand this? Well, when you sit and you start to get quiet, have you noticed, at least those of you who've had the experience of this retreat of getting quiet for certain sittings, okay, start to get silent and the body settles down and the thoughts get a bit more silent. It gets real empty and quiet and peaceful in there. And then different things will arise. Sometimes you get lonely. Oh, my heavens, it's getting so quiet. Well, I'll disappear or I want to make contact. 
this loneliness is kind of a, a, a friend of emptiness, because in a sense, when you start to see emptiness and selflessness, you see that we're all alone in this process. But there's a deeper seeing of it which comes. That is, it gets quiet and silent and open. And all of a sudden, the thought sneaks in the back and says, gee, it's getting awfully quiet in here now, isn't it? I wonder what's going to happen next. Maybe as my meditation develops, the quiet will go into light or I'll understand some new things. And then when I go back, I can tell this person about it, blah, 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 and it fills itself up. And all of a sudden, you notice that that space and that silence and that quiet is filled. Okay? Because it gets, for most people, a little bit scary when it gets quiet. It gets scary first because there's the unknown, what's going to happen next. But also it gets scary because as the thoughts start to disappear, who else starts to disappear? That's right, you do. Because most of what makes us up is, I'm going to do this and be that, and I remember this, and these are my friends, and this is my name. You don't have a name. Really, it's just a thought. And so when the thoughts start to go away, the whole sense of self starts to vanish. And most of our life and our culture is to kind of patch it up quickly, keep it busy and keep it going, keep exciting things, try and get enough moments of pleasure so we don't have to look at dukkha, and try and hold on to it as best we can so we don't have to look at the fact of life and death and change and impermanence, and keep it full so we don't feel the truth of nothingness, of emptiness. Yet, to understand it more deeply, it's not that we have to make it empty and all the thoughts disappear. For the thoughts themselves are selfless, are not owned or ownerless. One of the editors of The Inquiring Mind, who's a wonderful friend, Wes Nisker, said the way that the contemporary understanding of the uh, three characteristics of Anicca, Dukkha, Anunnaka is better understood as life's hard, it'll put you through changes, but don't take it personally. <laughs> so it's hard, there's dukkha, and it puts you through changes. Don't take it personally means that as you pay attention to it, you see, first of all, that most of what you look at happens by itself. Your heart beats by itself. Your breath, you can control it a little bit. Mostly it breathes by itself. Your feelings come by themselves, mostly, don't they? The sensations in the body come by themselves. The thoughts, God knows you can't control those. They come by themselves. Pictures, images. It all happens by certain laws of cause and effect and so forth, all by itself. That's part of the meaning of selflessness, that it's not owned. If you owned it, you could say, okay, don't get old. But look in the mirror. I mean, it's an amazing thing to look in the mirror and see there are more lines and there's less hair here, and it's just what it does. And you say, don't do that. I don't want you to. Does it listen? Not a chance. You say, don't think. Ha. You know? It's just another thought, right? It's just another thought on the pile of it. So that's one way of seeing selflessness, that none of it is or very little of it is in our voluntary control. But it happens by itself. The second thing that we can see, as I mentioned, is that most of our sense of self is built on thought. When thoughts disappear and we're really in the moment, there's just seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, and there isn't so much of a sense of I or what we call ourselves or our self-images. There isn't a sense of separation. There's just this play of senses in space. And sometimes you can feel that. Your eyes are closed and there's not much thinking and there's just hearing and sensing and it's just moving in space. And that's really all it is. It's done with mirrors. It's just this movement of consciousness reflecting the six sense objects of seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, and so forth. Another way to understand this selflessness, is to see that it all comes out of nothing. Where are the sittings that you did today? All those thoughts, all those feelings, all those experiences, gone. 
What happened to yesterday? Or the day before? What happened to the trip that you took, the plane flight to come to the retreat, or the drive that you took down? Disappeared, gone. Where did it go? Back into the void, nowhere, out of which it came. What happened to the first two-thirds of this evening's talk? Where is it? It's gone. It's back with George Washington and with Alexander the Great and um, Cleopatra and Neanderthal man and the dinosaurs and stuff. It's gone back into the void. And if you look in it, there's a word, say, um, orange or apricot or uh, Constantinople. There it is. It comes out. You hear it. And then it's gone. Or you have a thought, picture something, it's there for a little while, disappears. Our whole life is that. Not only is it impermanent, but it comes out of nothing and it goes back into this creative nothingness. Does that make any sense to you? It doesn't matter, it's true. <laughs> So one can start to see in different ways in one's practice the teachings of selflessness, that you don't control it, that it's really not your body, you rent it for a while. You know, The rent sometimes is exorbitant, but that's in keeping with the times. You use it, and it does what it wants, and it dies, and you can't say anything about it. But don't do that. It does not listen. Thoughts, the mind, much the same and that they come out of nothingness, and then they disappear back, and you, you become dust and all the rest of that stuff, earth and the elements. So we come home to ourselves, and we see that we are nothing, just this empty dance of the senses from Lama Kalu Rinpoche. You live in the illusion and the appearance of things. There is a reality. You are that reality, but you do not know it. When you see this, you will see that you are nothing. And being nothing, you are everything. That is all. There's just seeing, hearing, tasting, smelling, which is what the world is composed of, changing. And there's no separate self in it at all. Sansanin, the Korean Zen master, when he went to sit in Bodhgaya under the Bodhi tree, he wrote this poem. He said, once a great man sat under this Bodhi tree, saw the morning star, and became enlightened. He absolutely believed his eyes. The sky is blue, the ground is brown, and believed his ears, nose, tongue, body, mind. Everything was as it is, with no hindrance. Everything complete with no hindrance. And so he became independent from time and space and attained freedom from life and death. And that freedom is possible not as something we gain, but as coming back to see the truth of the moment. So our practice through investigation, through interest, through discipline, through schedule, through our loving concern, through all these aspects and motivations, all of us brings it back home to the essence of what makes up life. And that's the whole teachings of the Buddha. Just look at the three characteristics, the sides of the coin, the aspects of this crystal. Impermanent, suffering or unsatisfactory, and selflessness. See it. Experience it. That's what's here. If you want to find out what awakening is, this is what it is about. There's nothing that anybody can give you because you are it already. You're already complete. There's seeing, there's hearing, there's tasting, there's smelling, there's thinking, and there's physical sensations. There'll never be any more. They, they change a little bit, but that's it. What could you add to that or subtract from it? What's here is what's here. And its very nature is dukkha, in part, both unsatisfactory and at times painful, it's impermanence, a changing, dancing process. I don't know why it is, but it is. And it's ownerless. From Zen Master Dogen, the way to close. 
Truth is perfect and complete in itself. It is not something newly discovered. It has always existed. Truth is not far away. It is nearer than near. There is no need to attain it or grasp it since not one of your steps leads away from it. Don't follow the advice of others. Rather, learn to listen to the voice within yourself. Your body and mind will become clear and you will realize the unity of all things. Even the slightest movement of your conceptual thought will prevent you from entering the palace of wisdom. Your search among books, sifting and shuffling through other people's words may lead you to the depths of knowledge, but it cannot help you to see the reflection of the truth in yourself. When you've thrown away all your conceptions of mind and body, all your hopes and aspirations, the original truth will appear in its fullness. In your meditation, you yourself are the mirror reflecting the solution of your questions. The human mind has absolute freedom within its nature. You can understand this freedom intuitively. Don't work towards it, but allow the work to be an expression of this freedom. Allow the work itself to be freedom. When you wish to rest, move your body slowly and stand up quietly. Practice this meditation in the morning and evening at any leisure time. There have been thousands upon thousands of students who have practiced meditation and attained its fruits. Don't doubt its possibilities because of the simplicity of its method. If you can't find the truth right where you are, where else do you think you will find it? Life is short, and no one knows what the next moment will bring. Open your heart and mind while you still have the opportunity. You will soon discover the treasure of wisdom, which in turn you can share abundantly with others, bringing them happiness, joy, and peace. That was written by Zen Master Dogen 12 centuries ago on the other side of the planet. And it's still the same seeing, hearing, smelling, touching, feeling, and thinking. It's still the same impermanence. It's the same dukkha and unsatisfactoriness. It's the same everything coming out of the void and returning to it. And that's the way it is. It's an amazing thing. Anyone who comes to understand it more in their life, there comes a, a just such a sense of ease and joy. I remember being with this old teacher in India, the old Bidiwala, Nisargadat Maharaj, one of the most inspiring masters that I'd ever met. And the quality of being around him was somebody who was utterly f fearless of death. He said, because this isn't me. I know it's not true. And he would just laugh. He said, sure, that's going to come, but that doesn't have anything to do with it. The truth is that it all changes. And he would just laugh about it. And there was such a sense of ease and peace and grace and a sense of love from him because he didn't want anything. Seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, it's already here. It's already complete. Questions, please. His way of teaching, it was really quite beautiful to be with him. Um, you'd come in first to see him. He had this little apartment, and um, 30 people maybe could fit in, and there would be meditations. And then 
he would kind of interview people or talk to them about their practice. That was his way of teaching. And when you came in new, instead of being put in the back and working your way up through the grace race until you could get closer to the teacher, um, his way was more to take the new people and put them right in the front and say, where are you coming from? And you could answer on whatever level you dared. You might say, I just came from New York. Or you might say, coming, there's no coming and going. There's just this timeless moment. And then he'd peer at you to see whether you were making that up or whether you genuinely realized it. And he would say to people when they arrived and he started to teach, he said, if you still think you're this physical body, he said, go practice somewhere else for a while and come back when you realize that you don't own this, that this is not who you are. And then maybe we can begin to talk. And when you had come back or had that understanding, he would say, now your practice is to become the quality of witnessing. And so in practice, following his way, people would become the witness to things, detaching themselves to some extent, not suppressing anything whatsoever, but allowing it to come and go in the space of mind or of the heart without any restriction, without any judgment. And when you had established very powerfully this ability to be aware or mindful or witness that which is here without reaction, then finally he would have you turn your attention to the witnessing itself and see that that which seemed like it was someone who's watching the passing show was only another equally impersonal process. Moments of seeing and the consciousness which knows it. Moments of sound, hearing, and the consciousness which knows it. Moments of sight and the impersonal consciousness which knows it. And none of those, the knowing or the object, can be grasped or taken to be self. And so his teachings led through a slightly different language in exactly the same direction. No, he died or whatever he did. He said he was going home, actually, was his expression of it, um, uh, about a year and a half or two years ago.